where AI is strong is where it can look at precedent and past realities. But the truth is that we live in language somewhere between who we really are and aspirationally who we want to be and are trying to become. Also, I think it actually represents a big opportunity for LSPs to expand their offering, right? LSPs that want to kind of tiptoe into localizing media assets, why not offer that? <laughs> it's not the best elevator pitch, Florian, I have to say, but there we go. We kind of understand what they do now. And welcome to Slater Pod, episode 54, the snow episode. <laughs> Hello, Florian. <laughs> hey there. Yes, it's the snow. It's snowing like crazy outside. It, it was about probably 10 centimeters of snow in the past one and a half hours. I'm so. jealous. You have snow. Madrid has snow. No snow in London yet, but mm. there's still time. There's time, but this snow in London is very rare, right? Yeah. I mean, I, we get a dusting normally once a, a year sprinkling. or something. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, given that we can't, go, we can't go outside and play in it. So <laughs> it's maybe a good thing. That's what I do over lunch. I'll go outside. <laughs> Build well, a this snowman. Is, this is, it's super, yeah, you could probably do it in like a minute because it's super sticky, super heavy, super um, wet snow. Perfect. Um, yeah, and in the mountains, it's probably an, a, a one meter now. So today, 54, um, we will talk about our brand new M&A report, which is coming out today, um, Friday. Uh, mm -hmm. By the giant UK defense contract, a uh, quick update on Capita TI being for sale or not for sale. Then an interesting Series B funding that could potentially impact certain parts of the media localization industry. And then just a little bit of an update on machine translation as a business in Japan. Today, we've got a super special guest. Very excited to talk to Casper Grothwald, president of Oxford Languages and the academic product director of Oxford University Press. Very timely that Casper is joining us because uh, Oxford Language actually features in our recent Data for AI report as a case study. Mm. And I just read it again to refresh. It's really interesting. Um, basically, just how it started for them. They said it started with the rise of like a handheld dictionary in ch marketing Japan, and they supplied started to supply a lot of the dictionaries uh, for those handhelds. And then this was kind of a catalyst for them, uh, is what Casper said in our report, to think about what they had built, not really as content, but as data. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that they went from this uh, dictionary publisher and really pivoted to a, um, a, a language data services provider. Uh, is, is how they're they're saying it. So uh, this is going to be great with Casper in, uh, you know, later on. Also, quick internal announcement. Uh, we're going to launch a, a design thinking workshop. That's a follow on from something we did uh, from a workshop we did probably about five, six months ago. Mm -hmm. And this one is a lot bigger. It's, uh, it's uh, three consecutive weeks. I mean, days and three consecutive weeks. What is design thinking and, and why do we run design thinking workshops? Well, it really helps LSPs, but also potentially globalization and localization teams uh, at, at big corporates to, um, to focus on the user or the client. So design thinking is an iterative process that uh, helps you to really focus more on the customer, the user. There's like a five... Um, um, step methodology, empathize mm -hmm. uh, with your users, define the needs of the users, ideate, challenging your assumptions, creating ideas, prototype, and then test. Uh, and so we uh, we got a really fantastic speaker for that, or well, wor workshop moderator rather, right? And uh, attendance is limited to only 20 seats. So head over to, to Slater.com and check out the, the event section and, and register there. So again, ideal for corporate localization teams, uh, LSPs, you know, owners, operations directors, uh, etc. Check it out. Esther. Yes. Tell us more about M&A. Uh, our reports, big thing, what is it, 50 pages, 45 pages? Quite 40. large. <laughs> 40. 40. Maybe, next year we'll, maybe next year will be 50 if there's slightly more M&A happening in 2021. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a lengthy, uh, packed full of M&A transactions and, and funding rounds as well. So we've got 40, 39 M&A transactions um, over the, 29, the 2019, um, amounting to, I think, disclosed totals of about two point or more than two billion 
dollars. Um, and on the funding side, we've got a dozen funding stories that we've analyzed, um, amounting to about 75 million uh, US dollars in core language industry funding. So we're looking at the trends, we're looking at some comparative data for I think the past three or four years now, we've been tracking and, and monitoring and analyzing the M&A trends um, in the industry. So yeah, really, really in-depth, really good, lots of insight. And it's, uh, I mean, it's it's just one place. It's like a single source for all of your M&A um, and funding transactions that took place in 2019. So definitely check it out. Let me ask you something. So how do you decide what transactions you're going to include and what transactions we're going to exclude? Right. Where do we draw mm. the line between? You mentioned before this is the core translation localization space. Yeah. So you know what what's core, what's not core, what's adjacent. What do we list? What what do we not list? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously we list everything which is translation, localization, interpreting, and related software. That that's sort of the easy core of the language industry. Um, I mean, I think obviously, and uh, we do it on a case by case basis. I would say, but we tend to exclude things which are sort of predominantly NLP with no obvious um, no obvious sort of crossover to to language. Particularly, but for example, you know, we obviously included uh, Lionbridge's sale of their um, AI division. Mm. That's that's obviously core. It impacts on on our industry for the funding. Um, I mean, we, we obviously keep an eye on, and even in this podcast, we're talking about a lot of sort of adjacent technologies or technologies that could become relevant for translation and, and localization. Um, so we do kind of list some of the most relevant ones there, which are probably sort of non-core. But when it comes to counting up the the totals and the figures for for the re, for the revenue, oh, sorry, for the for the funding totals, um, when we're talking about seventy four million in funding, that's the core of funding in translation localization yeah it makes sense because otherwise you if you include uh those kind of one step removed companies then it, it really can skew the yeah. entire yeah um, exactly these the other companies are getting sort of a hundred million dollars in funding i mean we're not seeing yeah. quite those amounts yet in in the core of language i mean Lilts this year, I think the biggest one in 20, last year, sorry, biggest one um, in 2020 was um, was Lilt with 25 million. That's right. Yeah. And they, they may have even closed that in 2019 at, towards mm. the end, but kept it from us for a long time. Why did you do that, Lilt? Tell us early. Um, cool. Moving from 25 million funding to $74 million in defense ministry contract in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much coming out of the UK in terms of yep. language. It's just, it's just so centralized. We spoke about it often, but it just continues to, um, yeah, it, well, amaze me because mm -hmm. other countries don't. And it's not just because we're, we're obviously have a, a bit of a, um, bias towards English research on the internet. Right. But actually mm -hmm. there's just so much coming out of the UK. Uh, so what's this one and, uh, yeah, what, what are next steps there? Yeah, it's a, it's a tender for translation and interpreting for the UK Ministry of Defence, the MOD. Uh, so they're looking for a new LSP, a new supplier um, for a tender or contract worth, I think it's £54 million, £74 million, you said. So that's over four years with an optional two-year extension. Um, but they're looking for face-to-face -face interpreting for the Ministry of Defence um, and translation as well. Um, it's actually part of an ongoing opportunity is what they've termed it. So it's, it sounds like this is actually an active con contract. So something that's already ongoing, already there, but they say that they're looking for an LSP to fulfill the ongoing contract. Um, and it's not clear whether that's kind of in conjunction with the incumbent supplier or, or what's going on behind the scenes there. Um, yeah, it's public sector. I mean, it, it's one of those kind of challenging ones in a way, because there's likely to be fluctuations in demand. Um, Lingus will need to be placed and supplied at, at short notice, sometimes abroad and in the MOD's um, overseas operations. Um, so huge tender, interesting one. Um, I think there it's an expression, a call for expression of interest, they've termed it really. Um, and I think you've got until the early February to express your interest. Express your interest. And mm. maybe one of the companies would be Capita, right? Uh, that big mm. uh, government services conglomerate. Um, and we just picked up on a story there that they have 
postponed the sale of some of those units, which includes the translation business? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it was put on hold was was the terminology used in the the news report that we picked up. Um, but I mean, just to refresh the memory of people who uh, are not up to date with the story, um, Capita PLC, so it's a large UK based um, outsourcing firm. They also have translation and interpreting unit called Capita TI, um, and they had planned to sell off. So this is going back to February 2020. They announced that they were planning to sell off translation and interpreting business along with eight others that were all part of their specialized or specialist services divisions, which are kind of non core to what Capita is trying to do overall. Uh, so they did want to sell it all collectively. So all nine of these businesses in one go um, to uh, for, to one bidder. So they were looking for one, one buyer, one bidder, and they were looking for a price tag of about 200 million pounds, $270 million. Um, but what they said is that um, obviously it kind of went quiet. We didn't hear anything. There was no deal concluded as far as we're aware. So in early January, they've now said that they're looking at, well, they've put on hold the sale of specialist services during the pandemic well yeah and then that should end hopefully soon that said though why they, they maybe potentially interested investors mm. from the language space which should still ping them for you know if they could maybe just take over capita ti uh, yeah i mean it's it a out. decent size it's a decent size business um in yeah. terms of language revenues it, i think it was 21 million dollars in 2019 um so it's not it's not Small in language, in, in, in LSP terms, um, EBITDA of 0.8 million GBP. Actually, that might have been pounds. I can't remember now whether it's 20 million pounds or US dollars, but it's some, somewhere in that region anyway. In that ballpark, as the Americans mm. would say. And also going to America with the next adjacent fundraising, mm. which we shall not include in our M&A and funding tracker next year or in, in yeah for 2021. But still, I, I like it and let's talk about it because it's... I think it's it's relevant to the language industry um, in in mm. more than one way. So a company called Descript, uh, well, Des Descript basically. I, yeah, that's it's uh, that that's 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 the name. I, D E S C R I P T Descript. They raised thirty million dollars Series B. And what is it? It's a tool that we're actually using to do some of the post production of the podcast and. Uh, I started using it about three years ago when they came out and it was a little too beta at the point. It was a little too slow. I didn't quite know how to use it in, in Slater's operations, but they've since upgraded a ton and we went back to using it again. So what is it? It's a, a, a media um, and podcasting video and audio tool and it's actually it's not SaaS. Uh, well it's SaaS, but it's actually you download a program to the mac or to mm -hmm. windows so it's not it's not a browser-based uh software and you basically from a language component what's what, what's interesting is you for example for this podcast you would upload the files the audio files and uh and also the video files but i'll speak about video later you would upload the audio file and then you would get a a, a transcription uh, well, an AI transcription, I think they're plugged into Google. I'm, I'm not sure anymore if that's still the case, but uh, you get a, 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 a transcript, an automatic transcript very quickly, and then it lets you edit the transcript very easily. And you can actually also edit the, when you, when you edit the video, you can connect it so you can edit the text and by editing the text, you you also edit the video. Like when you're removing an um, in the text, it would literally mm. remove the, the video sequence where you're saying um, <laughs> right? So that's probably the worst description of the script ever. I'm so <laughs> it's sorry. It's not the to, best uh, elevator pitch, Florian, I have to say. Not the best. There we go. Exactly. We kind of understand what they do now. So sorry, Andrew Mason, uh, the CEO and founder of the company, uh, who also was the founder uh, or one of the co-founders of uh, Groupon, that uh, mm -hmm. popular platform that's what people know him for. So... Interestingly, now they're also this is so basically this is a consumer like an individual business. It's not really an enterprise business yet, but apparently they've been signing on customers like NPR, Vice, Washington Post, New York Times. You know who knows what what these uh, publishers do with uh, mm -hmm. with the script, but they've started signing on some bigger accounts. And this round was led by uh, VCs from Spark Capital, 
Andreessen Horowitz, uh, one of the you know top ones, and lo and behold, Redpoint Ventures. And we know uh-huh. Redpoint Ventures because they're also uh, the VCs behind Lilt. Lilt again, yeah. Lilt again. So there you go. So Redpoint, uh, Tom Tungush, uh, I'm not sure if he's the partner in charge of that, but definitely Redpoint is uh, the, the VC that's funding Lilt. Mm. And so one of the VCs said, the, you know, this script takes some very complicated technology and presents it in a way that's easier to use than some of the status quo pro- products. And I can I concur because when we started the podcast, we were looking at a number of different tools and it's mm. uh, a lot simpler and a lot more intuitive than some of the legacy audio products, which if you're not, if you're not an audio or video producer, you just struggle to, to, to understand. Um, look. Relevant to the language industry, again, it's because it's consumer at this point, but it's going to maybe go a little bit more enterprise and it, it it's going to be relevant for some of the, uh, the lower level, uh, media localization, uh, work, some of the corporate, mm-hmm. uh, media localization, uh, like localization work of media assets. Also, I think it actually represents a big opportunity for LSPs to expand their offering, right? LSPs that want to kind of tiptoe into, uh, localizing media assets, why not offer that? You know, you use that tool, you you have your people, you train your people on uh, cleaning up uh, transcriptions, uh, potentially you translate it, maybe you can do a post editing of the DMT, and then you can offer like podcast editing and, and multilingual podcast editing, for example. Mm. Stuff like that, right? It's just another arrow in the quiver for uh, LSPs that want to expand that go into adjacent businesses like the Data for AI, which we published that report. Like we're trying to give here a, a few additional ideas uh, for expansion uh, for LSPs. And this is definitely yeah. a tool that's uh, probably going to be on the winning side. I mean, it's already quite quite good, except um, a few things. But I mean, if they've raised 30 million, then, uh, you know, the journey is going to, the product's going to get better. One of the key problems that we encountered was that, um, for example, it's a little heavy, like the, the rendering of a video is, is still very slow. Or um, when you're doing like screen recording, it like it would just almost freeze your entire computer. And uh, we're on we're in some powerful MacBook Pros here, so I don't know. Uh, maybe they're gonna uh, boost that engine a little bit. Mm. Moving to our final story is Rosetta. Um, Rosetta is a machine translation slash human translation company in Japan, and they publish mm. quarterly results for their third quarter of the financial year 2021. It's the Japanese thing. It's always kind of one, uh, it's a couple of quarters ahead. So they generated for the th- for the nine month, so this is not full year, for the nine months, they did about $20 million in machine translation only, mm-hmm. about $6.5 million in human translation, and then have some crowdsourcing and interpreting business that was mostly down. But hey, look at that. They the machine translation business grew by 40% and the human translation business was down 40% roughly. Um, Interesting. I mean, the fact that they have a $20 million MT business alone is actually, must be one of the- Quite sizable. It's very sizable. Mm. I mean, we might've spoken about them before, but $20 million in nine months for MT only- that's mm. a lot. That's 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 a lot of contracts. That's gazillion words, right? If you if you counted it that way. Also, another mildly interesting observation here is that the human translation business, despite being down forty percent, actually still generated a profit of roughly a hundred thousand dollars U.S. dollars. Mm-hmm. So that is interesting from one point of view because it shows how easily or how well not easily but how fast. If you put your mind to it, as an LSP, you can scale down your operations and still make money, mm. right? I mean, in other businesses, if you lost 40% of your revenues, you'd struggle to still make a profit. I mean, mm-hmm. look at all the restaurants right now, right? That lose, yeah. you know, 50, 60, 80% of their business. I mean, they're still going to have to pay rent. They're still going to have to have a bunch of other fixed costs. They can't scale down that quickly. LSPs can scale down relatively quickly unless they mm-hmm. have a, a lot of internal linguists. So that's uh, one of the one of the observations from this particular set of results and confirms some of the things we've been saying in the past that, uh, you know, can scale up quite easily, but it can also scale down quite easily in a crisis. Uh, that's why we probably haven't seen too many business failures that, uh, despite uh, some of the hard hit uh, verticals in, in, you know, travel, retail, et cetera. Hmm. Well, and most people are, most LSPs are quite well diversified across sectors as well. Yeah. Yeah. Even if they aren't, they can scale down um, relatively quickly. So... Hmm. 
Let's head over to Casper Grothwell. Um, again, President of Oxford Languages, Academic Product Director, Oxford University Press. See you in a bit. See you. And welcome back here at SlaterPod 54, today with Casper Grathwell, president at uh, Oxford Languages at OUP. Welcome to SlaterBot, Casper. Thank you, Florian. I appreciate you guys having me on. Hi, Casper. Welcome. Hi, Esther. How are you? Hey, good, thanks. Good, good. Great. Great to have you on. Casper, uh, where does this podcast find you? Actually, um, I'm based in New York, but right now we're uh, on Sanibel Island in Florida in the U.S., where um, we have decided not to travel back up to the frigid north in January uh, quite yet. So we're on the beach. <laughs> I don't yeah, say just, that. I don't say that to rub it in at all. Yeah, but you are because I was just talking to Esther before. Like outside, we we basically have a blizzard outside. Like our first oh, blizzard no. in season. like no. deep, deep mid winter snow. Uh -oh. All right. Well, we'll send the rescue dog soon. Yeah, and uh, my kid, my my older son, just insisted on wearing sneakers this morning. So I don't know how I'm going to get him home. But anyway, uh, here we are. Uh, great. I, I want to be in the south. So. Casper, I introduced you in, in, in the previous segment a little bit, but uh, uh, you carry kind of two hats, two roles. So I introduced you as the president of Oxford Languages, but also the academic product director at Oxford University Press. Mm -hmm. Basically, just tell us a bit more about the two roles, or I guess the Oxford Languages one is the one we want to talk today uh, more about. But just tell us a bit more about your background, those two roles, and, uh, sure. and how long you've been with that company. Sure. Um, so I... I think I'm what they call a lifer, um, or they used to at um, uh, Oxford University Press. I've been there um, over 20 years, and I've had a variety of roles within the business. Right now, so I run the Oxford Languages uh, division, and this uh, part of the press is where our dictionary publishing is. It's where the Oxford English Dictionary, you know, that sort of uh, that iconic brand and program uh, sits, as well as our language data services, language uh, engineering, and um, uh, work there. And that's probably what's most relevant for this uh, conversation. I also serve uh, currently as the academic product director, and that's really about our academic publishing at Oxford University Press, which includes our you know, our, our journals, our academic monographs, the work that we do for the scholarly community. That's the, the market there is mainly uh, the institutional market around um, libraries at universities, schools, um, governments, where uh, we're focused squarely on that technology sector uh, that, and that subsector that's interested in language data services in the Oxford Languages program. Got it. And and usually you say you're based uh, in the frigid north, but uh, it, it, the team broadly, is it centered around Oxford or is it also? It is. It is. I mean, what's interesting is the pandemic will change things, but I had uh, up until last year spent about half my time in Oxford, half my time in New York. And mm. um, I would go back and forth because the real energy of the program is in Oxford. That's where, you know, the, the, the gravity and the uh, majority of our resources sit. Um, but of course, now everyone is remote. You could be anywhere. So I, I'll be interested to see how that plays out, um, you know, as things start to stabilize after the virus uh, gets under control. Hmm. Yeah, I think we're not too far away from that. I, 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 I hope. <laughs> and and this is quite a timely podcast as well, because I know you contributed recently to our uh, data for AI report, and we had a case study of OUP, I did. Oxford Languages there, which was great. Yeah, but yeah. Can you maybe give us a short overview of the types of data that you work with and the types of lexical data that you license and maintain for different companies? Sure, sure. So... You know, the, the key word that you said there was lexical. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different types of language data, and we focus on lexical uh, data, which really, and, and lexicographical data, that's data that at its core had originally um, come out of dictionaries. It's, it's um, dictionary definitions and and uh, thesaurus information, synonyms, antonyms, it's sample sentences, it's the kind of um, of language material that originally had been in what we would consider a traditional dictionary. As we shifted from thinking about the dictionary content as content to it actually being data, 
that re- that mindset shift um, expanded kind of the, the, what we what we offer in a way that the lexical data that we had been building for dictionaries actually is a is a not so common a kind of data that is valuable for a variety of uh, uses within the technology sector around whether it be localization or machine translation or AI training and you know highly structured lexical data is a sub very you know specific subset but a very valuable one and so we spend time now building lexical data um, across a variety of languages we build it down to the sense level in terms of the kind of uh, you know the identification of words and the, and the disambiguation there um, and we enrich that traditional data with a lot more intelligent information um, and um, additional sort of material that ends up um, pr- making it much more useful for specific use cases that the technology sector will have. So things other, you know, common things such as frequency or sentiment or, you know, uh, a variety of things like that, but also um, how you link at the sense level uh, in a multilingual um, way for to help with translation or, or things like this. So we're constantly getting a request to enrich our existing data in different ways to make it more valuable for those customers. And that's become a big business um, for us across, as I said, maybe about um, 40 or 50 languages. Hmm. And I mean, has that shifted a a bit in terms of what you're doing when it was purely kind of the the print and dictionary based to what you're doing now with the language data? And what what was the rationale for that that sort of transition? No, absolutely. Um, I saw. Um, hope I'm not giving away any of your trade secrets of how you work the podcast. But you sent me a question in, in advance that you might ask that said, "I'm reading it right here." Rationale behind expanding from dictionaries and print to a language data services. And I thought when I thought about that question, I thought, "What our rationale was basically survival." Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's. Um, as we all know, the you know the idea of a dictionary has been so disrupted and exploded in the digital age that most traditional dictionary publishers, you know, ha- have either you know no longer are involved in that business anymore, or you know are are struggling in a way that we started to anticipate that and see that um, you know even twenty years ago. And what I think was the most helpful part of the lifeline we had was that. We'd started getting involved in Japan with handheld dict- uh, bilingual Japanese English dictionaries. There was a big need in that market. There was big demand in that market for handheld electronic dictionaries. And this is, you know, this is in the late '90s, you know, early 2000s. And we supplied a lot of that. And that's what, when I was said, sort of we, our mind shift from content to actually what we have is data, you know, that's when we started to think about what we do as as language data service. And it really has transformed our business over the years. And and, you know, in terms of I mean, I it's it's interesting. We we still well, we still publish dictionaries in a sense, and we work on the same kind of data, but for such radically different uses and to such a different market that it doesn't even feel accurate to describe us as a dictionary publisher anymore. And that and that was a gradual transition, but I think a lot of people aren't aware that what we really do is enhanced data services around lexical content now. And we have we still have lexicographers and language specialists on staff. We've got, you know, maybe um Oh, over a hundred people who work within the program who are who have that kind of specialized training and expertise, but we now have a large group of people who are language engineers and data specialists and the ones who you know really are working with those language specialists to make sure that we can provide the kind of enhanced and robust data that meets the demands um, that are coming out of the tech sector. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Speaking of tech, I mean, also let's take a bit of a macro look here. So even in the, well, half a decade now that, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've done Slater, yeah. it, there's been, it's kind of come out of obscurity, this language data services, but also, you know, uh, curation space. But I mean, you know, your journey has been longer. So how would you describe what were some of the really key things, key drivers, key innovations that happened in the broader uh, digital space that took this from 
a very, very, very niche space to now, you know, companies like Lionbridge selling it for a billion dollars or Apple yeah, being yeah. valued at $3 billion. Like yeah, what was yeah. the journey there? Well, I think that, I mean, there's others who probably understand this from a slightly different perspective. And mine comes from, uh, you know, from our journey at OUP, as you said, but I think some of it comes from the, the way in which, um, the technology sector, in particular, driven by big tech, they they moved into like how they've wanted to localize. You know how they've thought about these what originally were secondary and tertiary markets that had language barriers, and now that they've kind of yoked the world, you know they're going deeper and deeper into local markets and need a kind of um, language data there that you know, we are a component of, you know, what we do is, is a small piece, but a very important piece. And so it's, it's, it's valuable. Another um, part of this, I think, um, in, it, and it's not just the localization, but also I think the, the sense of how AI has evolved and needs training data and how machine translation and neural networks are, are, are have been changing things. What they, what they have needed is, well, at first they needed a lot of data, but what we quickly realized as an industry is they, they need really clean data. They need really um, – the more sophisticated the data, the more effective those tools and applications are that you're building out of them. And that's, again, where this structured data is really valuable because um, one of the, the, the aspects of it is that it often is highly curated. Even if it had started out in a big data sense through um, – uh, Kind of community gathering project or something like this, you know, there is a scrubbing and a and a, and a work that's done on it that makes it um, much more valuable for a lot of purposes. And so, it's those kind of developments that I think have really driven the language data field. And it's been really encouraging to see this kind of growth. I was worried for a period of time that, particularly with with the major world languages, that as the need for the structured data um, as we exploited it, the the networks, the MT, the all of the different um, applications and and software would quickly leapfrog and bypass the need for this kind of data, and that we'd be very valuable for a time, and then the industry would leave us behind unless we pivoted to do something else. What I found really interesting is that's not the case. There's there continues to be a need for as as the industry use cases evolve, there continues to be needs to modify, continually modify and enhance and evolve that structured clean data. And also with that localization, you know, as as companies um, and move into low uh, re markets with low resource language uh, needs and, and requirements, that more and more languages are being enfranchised in that digital iteration, you know, that technology iteration, that has proven to be a much longer process and one that's really resilient when it comes to the need for the kind of data that we can produce. Hmm. And who produces data? No, let me, uh, that, was a, that was an awkward segue. Let me just yeah, yeah, uh, sure. rephrase that a little bit. In terms of the team composition, well, who, yeah, in a sense, who structures the data? Who? What kind of professionals do you have? What kind of? Uh, sure. What are their roles? What kind of positions now are you hiring for? Like, just mm -hmm. give us a sense of the team behind uh, that that's doing this. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we have, um, as I said before, we'd started out really with our core strength being lexicographical expertise. The the editors who can check, validate, verify, um, you know, really ensure that that structured data is clean and, and is um, robust in the ways that uh, consistently it needs to be. More and more, we've now moved towards a competency around the language engineering, data architecture. Um, we've got um, semantic engineers um, who work in our program. And and I think that that's that's an area of our business that's grown over the last um, several years. We've we've layered in more people in our data, in particular in our data um, teams, and and I think that that's probably where you would 
notice the transformation of our program if you looked at it maybe four or five years ago and, and you looked at it now. But one of the things I think is kind of interesting is that the makeup of the program looks if, – if you would have asked me what – what it would look like five years from now, five years ago, I would have thought it would have changed more radically than it has. Um, hmm. And and some of that is probably down to things don't ever change as quickly as you as you think they're going to, and also they change way more quickly. You know that adage about you know both fast and slow. Um, but also, I think it's we're at a particularly pivotal point in our evolution as a language technology business in that. We have we've got a couple fantastic competencies. You know, our lexicographical experience, as I said, and expertise is unrivaled in English, and we've got a power brand. Um, you know, those two things are kind of I, I, you know you, anybody would immediately say like, oh yeah, that you know what you got. What we don't have the the bench strength and the and the traditional um, power in is around software development, the building of the tools and applications, you know, um, and so, and a kind of um, sophisticated enrichment of our data that requires a lot of semantic engineering. As I said, we're building up that that capability, but we don't have it yet. And that's one of the reasons why I've, when I've been talking to a lot of people, I've been interested in partnerships. I've been interested in industry partnerships because we have such a very specific and not so common uh, competency that that a complementary competency could be really interesting as a way for us to build, as opposed to bringing that all in house. Partner with a group that with an organization an institution that has that kind of software capability that's in the language engineering space around tools and the next point on the value chain. I think that's really interesting, and I and I've been searching and looking and trying to talk to a lot of businesses and finding a right fit for us and for them, so that we can expand the range of um, kind of materials and 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 the role we play in the industry. And um, I you know I, I think that there's a real opportunity there. Got it. Yeah. yeah. For sure. And I mean, there's a range of customers, obviously, now that you work with as a business. Uh, can you tell yes. us about some of the similarities and differences you've observed from the traditional dictionary publisher side and compared with big tech clients that you're working with as well? Yeah, I mean, I think as we became, as we transitioned from a dictionary publisher to a language data provider, um, it, the use case was one that at first was fairly straightforward and expected. It was one where it was more about surfacing our dictionary-related content or data in uh, the digital realm. So, you know, when you think about a display case for a scroll over and you want to see a definition of something or, um, you know, the kind of ways in which an online dictionary, for example, you know, a digital dictionary embedded into some um, operating system or a piece of software. That's really how it started for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and it made sense because that bridge was the easiest to cross. It's kind of, it is what we were doing in our print dictionary realm and we just transferred it to that same kind of experience uh, in the digital world. Now that our language data is more, um, and is deeper embedded and is, and is not necessarily about surfacing in a display sense. I mean, it still happens and you can see Oxford's data around the world with big tech players as they surface it sometimes for, for purely lexical queries and things like that. Um, it now also plays a heavy role uh, like a lot of other language data, which is you don't see it. It's, it's foundational and it's used um, you know, to, to, as, as, a, as a stepping stone to build some of these more sophisticated experiences. And that's where it requires a lot of enhancement, um, standardization, and, and, and richness. It's worth noting that part of our model was that over the last, say, 15 years or so, as we started to work with big tech companies in particular that were looking for more traditional dictionary data, but to be exploited in their um, environments, we started not just licensing our bilingual material and our English monolingual material, but we started going out to um, the traditional dictionary publishers in a variety of local language markets. And we 
we identified the most trusted brand and the most trusted dictionary in that market. And a lot of times, the business that supported that uh, those lexical resources in print, they didn't have the scale or the capability to be making that digital transition themselves. And so we went and we've licensed now in at least 30 or 40 languages the best traditional lexical material in those languages. And as we bring them into Oxford, we standardize them as best you can. I mean, as you know, you know, standardization across languages is a little trickier than than some people would like to think it is. And um, mm -hmm. but we standardize it into into formats. We clean it. Um, we prepare it so that we've got a clearinghouse of lexical data, the best in the world, that then becomes a one stop shop for a lot of those technology companies. That's most effective for big tech because they've got the need for the widest number of languages and the widest number of use cases within a single business. But subsets of them, in particular language pairings, are valuable for a variety of tech uh, businesses for different use cases. Um, and we've seen those use cases continue to evolve in a way that has been very heartening when I think about the future of our business. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, something I wanted to pick up on as well is the, the idea of low resource languages and the importance yeah. of, I think you described it as sort of like tier two languages. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you've got a, a content building hub in local market in India. So can you tell us a bit about what they're doing, the logic for having it in India, um, things like that? Sure, sure. And uh, so it was about 2012, I think, that we started a program called Oxford Global Languages. And the point of it was to focus, we identified identified at that point that there is a real challenge around low resource languages in the digital space. And mm -hmm. Oxford University Press is a department of Oxford University. We're a not-for-profit. We, you know, we are mission-based. And what the challenge there was, it was surprising how few, how few languages, really just the world's global, you know, big languages, were the ones that were that had enough gravity of language data that they were naturally iterating as um, the versions of technology continued to evolve. You know, they were, they were, they were just carried with it. But after like, say, even 10 to 12 languages, which at that point might have even been a little generous, um, it just fell off a cliff in terms of the kind of local language development that was happening. And so we focused on the idea that the global language tapestry is going to be a lot more rich and communication is going to be a lot more effective if we can help give a boost to those languages that not endangered languages but those languages that might have millions of speakers but are are not you're you're not seeing them um in the applications and softwares and digital lives that you're leading. Mm -hmm. We're not the only business that 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 has done this and you know there's and now it's really nice to see a network and a web uh, almost a community coming up of language data people and and others in the technology space that are that are really focused on this and trying to work on it. Um, and we we started with this hub in India as you said the the Indian business um, is one where we realized we needed an in-market um, group that was able to um, provide some of that lexical expertise um, in a dynamic way on the ground there and was also really close to the needs of that market in particular so that they could help us, whether it's a, a company that's interested in Indian languages and they're not an India, a local Indian business or not, you know, they needed to understand what those requirements were on the ground and, um, and, and how we were enhancing, um, that data and for what purposes. And so we've got a unit there now that it's, it's interesting in that it's a, it's a, it's a mix of freelance and contract and on staff people in a way that it's also uh, been spearheading our building of a broader network the way that a lot of other language data businesses have you know they've got you know I I, I joke sometimes and I've, I've I've joked with this Florian with this too which is um when I first was trying starting to get familiar with the LSPs and I thought god these companies are so big and they're so sophisticated and and, and as I looked behind the curtain I thought you know what more than anything, what their core competency is, they're project management businesses. You know, they're they're hardly even language businesses. You know, what they what they specialize in is project management. You know, and and that's no offense to any LSPs who might be listening to this. Um, 
and because that's a hard thing to do when you're talking about 8,000, you know, people that you're pulling in to contribute to, you know, a project. We, that isn't our specialty. You know, ours is really around the expertise that comes when you are validating a lot of what that, um, you know, big project management can yield. Um, but our India hub is really about us um, trying to find a hybrid there to make sure that we're doing bottom up in terms of bringing in uh, and building new data and then having a team that can that really has the expertise to validate that in a way that um, it can be highly effective for the companies that we're working with. And so far, it's been a great success story. We've moved into and we've built um, linked data sets um, in about six or eight of the kind of 12 major languages of, of <clears throat> um, in, in Indian languages. And the demand's been growing rapidly for those, uh, for that work. And um, it started with big tech. And um, but now I'm really pleased to see that there's a wider variety of um, small and medium sized enterprise businesses that are um, interested in in exploiting this data. And um, we'll be thinking about then that model as we move beyond, you know, what comes after this India hub, you know, are we going to be expanding to other areas? And um, I think it's, it's not a replicable exactly, but the Southeast Asia has a lot of need around some of those uh, local languages. And what I'm really interested in and watching closely is um, African languages. African languages are really interesting to me, partly because I feel like from a mission point of view, that's that's really um, valuable and needed. And that market's so slow to come on because um, of the low economic value that a lot of businesses see in moving into those markets. And so the more we can be one of a community of companies that help build the f that help create the building blocks for that localization, the bar for companies wanting to localize into African languages will continue to go down. It'll be easier and easier and less expensive to do. And that will that will speed up the rate at which we enfranchise these African languages, which are really important. And so there are there are still some some places around the world that I think that that model we've set up in India could be replicated over time. I got a couple of follow-ups on India here. So oh, sure. f first, are you doing, when you're going into these languages, are you doing like very basic codifying work, kind of like <clears throat> languages that really haven't been like, you know, there's not, there's no Oxford dictionary for some of these languages and you're kind of sure. putting in a base layer of grammar, syntax, et cetera, yes, uh, uh, exactly. codifying rules. and. We are. We is are. that even today, like in 2021? Like, yeah, like it you'd be surprised. It is. I mean, you know, and if it's been there, it's been there in a uh, much more ad hoc way or hasn't been um, done in a way that then becomes machine readable and, um, you know, and usable, you know, from, from a technology company point of view um, or, or from a software developer point of view. And, um, so some of that's some of that is re, is really needed, and of course sometimes it's been just the core data. There might be a dictionary and a or a thesaurus, but what you need are um, a lot of the grammars. What you need are a lot, you know, some some idiomatic um, uh, data. You need um, really good morphologizers for some of these. You need, you know, there's there's a lot of of um, and then and then also linking that one of the things that we're working on within Indian languages isn't just um, uh, bilingual with English, but is a multilingual net so that, and again, linked at the sense level. And I think that's really valuable for whether it be AI training or uh, neural machine translation or what have you, where um, you at a sense level have a dictionary entry um, all of the synonyms and antonyms, um, a large bank of example sentences that have been qualified and are uh, uh, tagged to that, all at the sense level linked to that exact same sense in another language with all of those other things, including then audio and things like this. And, and then, and, and, you know, you then put those together and I think it creates a one, as I said, one of the building blocks that allows you to do a lot more sophisticated 
um, software development and building of application and tools than you could otherwise. Mm. Got it. Yeah. And, and we've talked about underserved languages then, but what areas of data provision do you think maybe are poorly served right now? And where's there an opportunity for LSPs and other providers to, to build those capabilities? Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I think that where, again, there, you know, I only see a, a certain sector of the market from, from the perspective mm -hmm. um, that we're at, which is pretty specialized, but I do some opportunities that I see. I mean, one, we've been talking about this for years, but I, I do think that um, Chinese big tech is a is a real opportunity right now in a way that, you know, we work with a lot of them and, and a lot of others do, but they have such a, um, China has such a strong uh, relationship into the developing world that, um, you know, and, and really because China has been such a big market and it's been evolving so quickly that there's been no need for those Chinese big tech companies to focus too much outside of China itself. You know, the, the, the pie has been growing and it's been really dynamically building. But I, but I see that starting to change. And I think that the you know, ironically, the pandemic, I think, will, will change things, um, it will make things move even more quickly. But um, uh, so Chinese big tech companies, as they start to look outward, you know, it, it's going to be interesting. Now, of course, there's things with, you know, the tension between India and China. And so, you know, what happens? Are they, you know, are they, how how welcome are they, you know, from a from a, a political point of view to be moving into some of these places? Well, that's a, that's a different question. But I do think that that interaction and integration of the Chinese big tech companies and a much wider variety of localization. Uh, I, I think that's a, a really interesting area. From a data point of view, I was just talking about this um, with um, Jan Vandermeer at Taos. Um, we were talking earlier today and um, we were saying that we we're noting that there's um, there's a real need for currency um, in the language data, the structured language data that we provide. So, so the lexical data, their um, currency is really important. And what it's, what, where it comes down to is um, a lot of technology companies have to be reflecting, not just providing, you know, using language uh, data as a, as a basis for some of their um, building, but when that language surfaces, they it has to be in a way that it, their users are feel like it reflects their value and the where the culture and society is seeing things at the moment, and that's really difficult to do. And <laughs> and. Difficult. You know, the big tech yeah. companies in particular, we see them get in trouble all the time where, you know, they've got some outdated thing for this or or, or uh, views have shifted. And so, you know, and that's also something that AI is going to take a long time before it gets sophisticated enough to kind of the, for the value judgments around these things. Because where AI is strong is where it can look at precedent and past uh, realities. But the truth is that we live in language somewhere between who we really are and aspirationally who we want to be and are trying to become. And the, the AI has a very good handle on the former and a very poor handle on the latter. Um, and yet there is a responsibility of a lot of the companies that we work with that they're reflecting, you know, uh, language in a way that's used. So, so for example, you know, with all of the, political um, protesting and, and things that happened last summer around the world, um, people were looking at how language was being used and reflected and taking people to task for when it wasn't and uh, used in a way that they felt like was was showing who we want to be as, as people. Um, the pandemic highlighted the fact that just the all of a sudden massive new vocabularies around kind of our the conditions of of our lives had had emerged because we needed new words to describe this unprecedented experience we're having on all fronts whether it was science or business or culture or you know medicine and um and, and if these companies aren't able to incorporate the those new words those new senses the new way we're using language they're missing out i think that's an interesting place to 
I'm, I'm wondering how the language data providers can add real value there. Um, you know, and I just think, of, I think about the number of times that we've updated and reviewed the definition, which or, or the, you know, the entry for, which is, which is various senses and a large uh, sort of uh, entry for the word marriage, you know, um, over the course of the last, you know, 15 years. And, mm. you know, it's sensitive. It's, and there's some, and there's, you know, there's, it's not easy to do because it's not as if like, oh, you just need to update it because now it's X, you know, there is, there are very, you know, the ways in which we experience and use and want to see language reflecting who we are is different in different parts of the world. And now that we're all, now that the, a, a global presence is so strong in seeing how it's used in other places, you've got all kinds of politics that run into play there. I, I find that to be a really interesting um, aspect that has I haven't seen people focus on that um, as much as as um, mm -hmm. they could. Yeah, very very interesting. Um, yeah, I could go off on a tangent on like the the <laughs> COVID COVID new vocabulary. Like for example, here in Switzerland, it just like we just capitulated and started using all of the English words. I mean, there's no yeah. word for lockdown. Like yeah. we just use lockdown. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so and and probably 50 terms uh, uh, more. Hey, uh, on the technology side, I know you guys launched uh, some new annotation visual vis visualization tools um, yeah. at the OEP lab. So are those purely for your internal use to make your internal people more productive or are you like licensing those as well to third parties? No, we're, we're, we're definitely licensing those. So, so you made reference to the OED labs. And so the OED labs is, um, Oxford English dictionary is OED. Um, the, Sorry. the, the labs, no, no, absolutely. The labs are, um, that's our kind of experimental team that really is trying to, um, play around with and build some interesting visualization tools, some, um, you know, s some ways that illuminate some of the um, richness and insights in the language data that we've got. Um, and we definitely are interested in commercially exploiting those tools. Um, and they, it, it's true that they're very helpful for our editors as well in, in, uh, giving them more efficiency around um, the kind of validation work that they're often doing. But I see potential applications uh, for some of these visualization tools that um, within the industry sector and mm. whether we bring them to market or we partner with someone else to help bring them to market, I think is interesting. And we're just about at a point where we've got two or three of these tools that are, um, you know, that, that now have enough kind of maturity that we're uh, looking at what that next step is in um, in uh, exploiting them. Got it. Uh, to close off on also on COVID, uh, but <laughs> yeah. since we're it's kind of probably hopefully at the tail end of this, yeah. did you see any impact in terms of the the nature of the work, the client composition from COVID, or was it just kind of steady and, and you know, again, like low research languages, this is, these are the growth areas. Or was there something that just COVID flicked the switch and yeah. you had you yeah. tripled volume in that particular part of the business? I mean, it's a good, um, it's a, it's a really good thing to, to ask. I, um, we've seen, Increase in demand in low resource languages, as you said, I think that's picked up and, and the like. More than anything, I've seen sort of incremental increases in certain areas that I can attribute to the to um, to the pandemic and the conditions. What I what I think is really interesting there is that one of the things I've also noted is that the way we talk about where the language industry language sort of data industry is and where it actually is, you know, there's about, there's always feels like there's been about a five year lag there between those two, <laughs> you know, and, um, and so, you know, we're actually much more doing things in a much more traditional way than we're talking about and like, and saying the industry's at, you know, you know, and one of the things that the pandemic done has done is it's flattened that Nice. Delta, you know, yeah. and now we're, it's almost like we're six months behind where we say we are, which actually is a paradigm shift. I mean, the difference between that many years and that many months is one that I think is going to 
have a long-term effect on our industry. And we're going to be kind of stumbling to try to understand how to exploit that and how to take advantage of the fact that um, uh, and, and turn it from a liability right now into an opportunity. Because I think that the closer those are now, there's going to be new business models, uses that kind of come now and, and ways of working and processes okay. where we had a lot of time before. And, you know, I know that's that's kind of talking in vague, vague terms, but I think other people within the language that, who are at LSPs will understand that what I'm saying there that, you know, I don't think we've, I think it's going to take us, you know, the next couple of years probably to really understand how to exploit the fact that the pace of digital communication change is now as rapid as what we thought it might be, you know, five or six years from now. Well, all of a sudden that happened now, but we didn't have five or six years to do all the evolutionary things that would have put us in the place where we serve it really well. So we're going to start seeing new gaps and then having to scramble to figure out how to fill those gaps in a way that, um, you know, the not, uh, the, the year of, of this pandemic has only really been the kind of coming out of the shock of it and dealing with the incremental uh, growth in the business because everybody, you know, of what we already do. But I think next will start to come some really interesting innovation. I don't know where what sect, where it's going to come from, but I, I can feel that it's 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 we're on the brink of it, and um, and it's going to suit us. It's going to suit a post pandemic world um, much better than we're doing now and i just don't know if we see it yet got it got it no interesting interesting thought i, I obviously I, I agree i think it's uh accelerated everything compressed it and yeah i mean the futures uh that we've talked about for a long time is kind of here yeah exactly in, in, many, exactly. in many ways yeah which so, is really well it's, it's both exciting and scary at the same time yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time, Casper. Oh, was, no, uh, I'm happy to chat. And, super um, interesting. No, no, thank you. And um, yeah, um, both of you, I appreciate the, the time you've put into this. Yeah, Absolutely. And uh, let's catch up at some point in real life. I think we're getting closer to the moment where we can I travel hope again. So. I'm ready I to go. So. Well, let's raise, raise a glass when we can. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.